I would love to welcome um, all of you to the first WBC Cares um, hot seat interview. And I'm super excited to introduce our first wonderful guest. Uh, and this is the legend and gentleman that is John H. Stracy. Um, the Bethnal Green boxer began boxing in his professional career in 1969, uh, went on to win 45 of his 51 bouts, and I think it was with 37 knockouts. Uh, in 75, uh, he was the underdog um, in a title fight in Mexico City with Jose Napoles, um, and came back from the first round, uh, been knocked down in the first round to steal this title. Um, and was the first British boxer to go over to Mexico and steal that title. And I believe is still the only person to do that. Um, sure. Still ranked eighth best welterweight in the world. Like I say, an absolute gentleman. Um, went on to defend that title and became undisputed with Hedman Lewis. Uh, I think that was in, in the UK. Um, the list goes on. It really, really does. So... We're very honoured and it's a massive pleasure for me to be able to, to do this with you, John, today. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be on the show. And, uh, yeah, some great times I had when I boxed. So, you know, I also boxed in Olympic Games in Mexico City. Oh, really? As an amateur. You came through the amateurs, right? Yeah, 1968. Do you know, I was 18 on the day that we flew out to Mexico City, 22nd of September. And wow. I was 18 on the day. Yeah, it was amazing. And, um, Especially. It was, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? It was, it, what was great about it, I, I boxed a guy who um, won the gold medal, Ronnie Harris, uh, from Ohio. Him and George Foreman. You remember George Foreman? Well, yeah. they both won the gold medal for America. And I lost on a majority decision to uh, Ronnie Harris. And he beat everybody... He, he had five fights. He won four of them by unanimous. And the one he beat me was majority. Oh. And he went on to win the gold medal. But not only that, Louise, he went on to win what they call the Val Barker Trophy, which is the best boxer considered of the games in the finals of all the fights. And so I lost to, at that time, the greatest boxer in, in the world. So I know it was, it, it was amazing. Wow. Um, so how did you get into boxing, John? Well, you know, I, I come from a place called Bethnal Green. And, um, the, you know, as a young kid, we lived on a council buildings. Funny enough, we lived right by the Blind Beggar, the famous Blind Beggar, where Ronnie Cray uh, shot and killed Georgie Cornell. And as a kid, I was about 15 and a half. And I, I actually used to go to school with Gary Cray, who was in my class at school. Um, and I used to knock on the door, see the twins, and then go to school. But um, <clears throat> right by us was, was uh, you know, the blind beggar. And because I was, as a young kid, you there? Yeah. Yeah, I've, the screen's just gone off. Let me just try and see if I get it back. Um, <clears throat> anyway, can you hear me? That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, you're still good. I can okay, see yeah, you. Okay, yeah, got it, yeah. Yeah, uh, so what happened? Because I was, you know, I was very small. Uh, when I left school, Louise, I was seven stone seven. Yeah, I was only small. Um, and so everybody used to pick on me. You know, I used to have kids pick on me when I was about nine or ten. And I could always fight, you know, I could always punch and, and I'd hit him. And people used to say, well, <clears throat> don't start on him because, you know, he's a good fighter. Um, and then I used to, you know, this is how the boxing started. I used to get parents come up to the flat where we lived in Bethnal Green and say, you know, your son, he, um, he's, look what he's done to my boy. And, I'd, you know, he'd have like a bruise on his face or I've hit him. But this is absolutely true. I said, Dad, he started on me first and he hit me first. I didn't hit him first. And then because it was happening, a, not frequently, but a few times, my dad said, right, I've had enough of all this. He said, if you want to fight, I'll take you to a boxing club and you can fight there. So I went, you know, a bit cocky. Yeah, all right then. And he took me to Repton Amateur <laughs> Boxing Club, which, as you probably know, is the most famous boxing club in Great Britain. Do you know it's had more champions than any other boxing club in history? It's, no. had, um, it's had every champion, British, European, um, World, Olympic, um, and every amateur championship won by the club. So it's, it's a massive club. And I was 11 and, about 11 and a half when I went up there. 
And, um, you know, I trained. Funny enough, I'll tell you a quick story. I started off Southpaw because I'm left handed. Okay. Yeah. And I, what I was doing, Louise, I was, I was just throwing me, he said to me, right, hit the bag. So I hit the bag and I was doing that across. And he said to me, throw your right hand. I said, I can't. He said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't. I can't throw me right hand. I can only throw me left. He said, well, turn around. So you know what I did? I did a complete circle and turned and stood back southpaw. And he went, no, turn around the other way. Punch with your left. So I punched the bag on the left. Then the right came over. Then the left. Then the right. And he said, that's it. That's what you got to do. And that was it. And I was, you know, and I came out of there doing a bit of skipping, shadow boxing. Then we walked through the park and then we got to the house and my dad said, did you enjoy it? I said, dad, I want to be a boxer. And that was it. I didn't want to do anything else but boxing. Wow. Um, yeah, and I started singing, as you probably know, I was a good singer as a kid. But um, no, I was... I didn't know that you were singing as a child. I was going to ask about... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I won... About the... Yeah, I won talent competitions and things like that. I used to sing all the time in different places as a, as a young lad. I've done, um, I've been to big theatres and sung, um, you know, places like uh, um, the halls in, in London, the massive halls in London. Uh, we used to do choir stuff and all that. Um, and I've always been a vocalist and always been able to sing. Um, but obviously boxing was my, you know, preferred uh, pleasure. And um, I just loved it. It, it, was, it was amazing, you know. Wow. Are you there? Yeah, gotcha. Back, yeah. we're back. Yeah, no, um, so, so what was nice when I boxed, I mean, I won everything I ever went in for as yeah. an amateur. I, I won uh, two junior ABAs, a schoolboy title, NABC title, style award winner. Um, and then I won the ABA seniors as an 18-year-old. Lost in the court, uh, semi-finals when I was 17. So I'd won everything up until then. And then I turned pro and obviously undefeated British and European world champion and then world to The only thing I didn't win, obviously, was a gold medal, but I still represented Great Britain in the Olympics. So, you know, eight out of nine are not bad. <laughs> That's why I'd say yeah. I started by saying the legend that is John H. Tracy because... Ah, it's lovely. Some, uh, that's some list of accolades there, Johnny. It really, really is. Um, so yeah, just before the, the camera froze, I don't know if you heard me uh, me say or if you you did say, who was your biggest um, inspiration in boxing growing up? Well, a guy called Sugar Ray Robinson. He was my absolute idol, and I had the very chance to meet him one day. Um, I used to read about him when I was a kid, and you know, in them days you didn't really see much. I, I'm talking about the fifties. Um, and then in the early 60s, he was uh, still boxing. But if you, if you, you know, if anyone wants to know how great boxing is and what our great people are, watch Sugar Ray Robinson. You can honestly, he, he is the most amazing person. I mean, he had uh, something like 170 fights before he lost his very first fight as amateur and professional. Wow. He was amazing. I've, I'll send you a video of him. He's amazing. You want to see him skip? He's unbelievable. Hitting the bag the ball and um you know he, he, and you know what was marvelous he had 200 professional fights right he lost 19 but he only lost three up to 15 years in his whole career right then after that he you know he was he, he was taxed and all that and he had to fight again and he was, he was losing on points to people he would have stopped years and years ago. But he only ever lost one fight stoppage. And he was winning. And, and he, um, it was amazing because it was the light heavyweight championship of the world. And it was Joey Maxim. And he was winning on all scorecards, right, up until the 13th round. And then he couldn't do any more because it was so hot there that he collapsed and he, you know, Fell out that he was really gone, lost over a stone. But he was winning on points, all judges, right? And the most amazing thing was the referee, Ruby Goldstein, had to be replaced after 10 rounds because he collapsed. 
and they put a referee. It's the only time in history, boxing history, that referee has been, uh, you know, substituted. And he was winning on all scorecards, but he had to pack in. And out of 200 fights, that was the only time of his career, you look it up, that he got stopped. He never stopped, never got stopped in 200 fights at once. That, and, and he was winning that fight. So if you watch him, and do you know what else is amazing with him as well, Louise? He, when he won the, the welterweight title, he defended five times between 1946 and 1951. But he had an extra 38 fights, which he won. But they weren't, they obviously weren't, they, they, they weren't title fights. So wow. if they had been title fights, he'd have had 43 straight off defences. What, what a man he was. What a man he was. My hero. Absolute my hero. And I boxed, I was very lucky to meet him as well, Louise. I went, I boxed on the Muhammad Ali Joe Bugner bill with John Conti, 1973 in Las Vegas. And as I came out the ring, um, he was sitting there and he walked over to me and he said, that was a great fight. I wish you all the very best. And I went, oh, thank you, Ray. You know, and then I went back to get a picture, but he'd gone. Oh. Oh, if I'd have had a picture with him, that would have been the greatest moment for me. Really, what? really. I mean, well, yeah, but what was it like to box on that undercard, though? Ah, oh, well, I'll tell you a quick story. I got a phone call. You know Mickey Duff, the promoter? I got a phone call from him, and he always called me John H. So the phone call, I was in Bethnal Green, living in the flats, 1972, December it was. And he said, uh, the phone went, and as soon as I heard John H, I knew it was Mickey Duff. And well, the reason I knew it was Mickey Duff, it was a reverse charge call. And the next thing, <laughs> and the next thing he's gone, He's gone, uh, John H. I went, hello, Mickey. He said, right, I've got something for you. I said, what's that? He said, you are boxing on the undercard of Muhammad Ali versus Joe Bugner. He said, two months' time, because it was December of 72. He said, February the 14th, Valentine's Day, he said, in, in Las Vegas, you know, at the Hilton Hotel Convention Center. So I went, oh, my God. So I whispered it to me dad. And my dad's doing this. So I went, how much? <laughs> and he went, he went 1,200. I went, bloody hell, is that all I've got to give you? I mean, I'd have paid him to box out there, you know. <laughs> and it was amazing because you had the Rat Pack watching the fights, you know, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin. Oh um, Elvis, I, met Elvis, I met Elvis Presley in the dressing room because we was actually appearing at where he was appearing for eight and a half years at the Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas. And he wished me good luck when I got up to fight. And it, honestly, can you see me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't see you. But anyway, um, yeah, so it was just amazing, you know, to, to meet Muhammad Ali and, and John Conti was on the bill as well. And, it's, you know, it's the only time that three boxers at that time from Britain had boxed the Americans. And uh, the great thing was we won 2-1. No. Yeah. The great no. thing was we won 2-1. You know, I won, obviously. John won. And yeah. Muhammad Ali beat Joe Bugner on points. But, you know, to, to, to go there, I mean, it, Joe Lewis was there. Joe wow. Lewis. He was the greeter of Caesar's Palace. No way. He was the greeter of Caesar's Palace, yeah. And wow. he was there. And there was Jake LaMotta. Um, there was, um, uh, what's the other fella, the, the American, uh, um, oh, I forgot his name for a minute. Anyway, the, there was George Foreman, Larry Holmes had just started professional. Wow. It, yeah, the boxers there, it, it was, you know, absolutely oh. amazing. Joe I, Lewis, I mean, and do you know what? I actually met Joe Lewis the month before in January in Nottingham at the ice rink. <laughs> they have boxing in the ice rink. Yeah. It's gone off again. Can you hear me? I don't know. So what happened, yeah, um, I boxed in top of the bill I was. Uh, John Conti was just underneath me in um, at the, uh, the, what's it called? The um, the skating rink. Oh, there's my... Nottingham, Nottingham ice rink. Yeah. 
and um, Joe Lewis was guest of honour. So I met him there, and then we met him again next month. So it was, it was. I mean, my career has been you know, absolutely been full of full of great people I've met, and you know, still friends with most of them today. And it's great. And and you know, Mike Tyson. Whenever I see Mike, he calls me, he he calls me Mr. Stracy. <laughs> and you know, no, but you know what it is? It, it it's like because I'm older than him, and you know, I, I remember him when he was first coming through. And I was, you know, and you see me boxing in Mexico and all that. He got this, like, he'll go, hello, Mr. Stracy. And I go, no, call me, call me John. Don't, don't call me Mr. Stracy. Uh, but he, you know, he, he insists. So what can I do? <laughs> One uh, of them things. Mike Tyson's birthday today? Sorry? Yes, it's his birthday today. We've sent him a message. Oh. Yeah, we've done that. Yeah, oh. he's, he's, he's a great guy. I mean, you know, most boxers are great guys. So, and, and it's, you know, I've got some great friends in boxing, the best ever. I mean, John Conti, what a lovely man he is. Certainly the short time that I've been involved with WBC within boxing, that's very much the experience I've had. I haven't um, met a, a person that hasn't just been a nice so person. passionate and, yeah, just genuine, honest people. And it's, it's lovely to be around. It really is. But, but do you know what I think as well, Louise? It's, it's because we're boxers and we go out there and we try to win the fights and we try and hurt people because that's your job. But when you do, don't do that, you just want to be friendly with everybody. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and, that's, and that's, that's really what it's about, you know. And when you see some of the boxers we, we know, they're gentle giants. They're, they're really, really lovely people. Um, but obviously, when you box, you want to hurt. You got to, you got to win. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, You've gone off again. That's it. That's better. Hello. Um, what something I wanted to ask you, John? Actually, it was, and it's something I've noticed. So, I'm an adaptive coach and an England boxing coach. And what I love about that is the the team spirit, the club yes. camaraderie. So, albeit boxing's a solitary sport. You're the only person responsible for the win, the loss, what happens in that ring. As an amateur or as an adaptive, um, we have team spirit. We have that. We've yeah. got you. You've got everybody rooting for you. How do you find the transition from going from that club level, the amateurs, even with the GB squad, because you go away to the Olympics and you've got a whole That's team. Right. Yes. Going that to boxing on your own with your very small team in a professional yeah. manner. I, I, I box on my own, so I can understand it, but I want to hear, obviously... I'm the transition, the transition. Yeah. Well, I think what it was, when I won the ABA title, uh, I then already signed a deal with uh, Terry Lawless, who was my manager for nine years, to, um, you know, be a professional. And I think what you do, you just somehow, you manage to adapt. Because when you're boxing amateur... You've got all your friends around you and everyone's, you know, there um, watching you. You're having good laughs. You can go out and have a good crack. But when you're a professional, you, you don't actually have great friends first off. It's only when you're in the gym, you're doing your sparring and then you become friends. So you're, you're virtually on your own as a professional. I'd say you're more on your own as a professional than you are as an amateur. I think you're right there. Mm. But... I think what happens is you grow and grow and grow and you become, you know, if, if you're good, you'll become very, very good. And then um, everyone around you gets together and then you form great friendships from there. But boxing is a very lone sport, especially professional. And you have to be very, you know, geared up for it. You have to want to win. That's the main thing. You've got to want to win in all circumstances, even if you're losing you got to turn it around and win. So you you know you do you do you do have a, a sense that it's just you. Um, and I always oh, laugh. Yeah. I always laugh at seconds when they go, you know, we do. When you go, you know, when you go out there, throw a punch, and then they'll say, we're not fighting good enough. We're not, and I think to myself, hang on, you're not in there, you know. <laughs> it's me who's got to do it. Um, but obviously, it's if you, okay, if isn't you it, when you're not doing it yourself. Yeah, if, but I think what happens is if you get someone good around you, like a good trainer, 
you are really sometimes um, fighting as well for him because you've built a bond up between you and you want to win and you go, I'm going to win for him, you know. But um, yeah, I think professional obviously is a more one-way boxing, uh, like a tunnel vision. Whereas mm. amateur, it's more of a, a, a friendly uh, camaraderie with your mates. And, you know, when you go, like, like what we used to do, if there could be four or five of us boxing on, each, on certain nights. Sometimes we come away five wins, sometimes we come away four wins. And the one who lost always felt bad. And you'd say, oh, I'm not having that again, I'm going to win. Um, and so, you know, that, that's your camaraderie with your amateur. But as a professional, yeah, you 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 are more on your own, um, and so that's that's what it's about. And and if you're good and make it, then you've you know you've done the hard part of it. That actually says me. One of the questions that's coming from our um, uh, younger boxers is, yeah. um, how do you motivate yourself to overcome those big challenges? So we talk about that transition, but what about yeah. that motivation? Well, I think what it is as well, you know, I, I, as I say, as an amateur, I won everything I went in for. So when I turn professional, I'm just thinking I want to be champion of the world. And we know not everyone does it. We all know that it can't be done. But when I was a young lad boxing, I, I, this is absolutely true. I used to write out posters. My dad used to fetch out um, big sheets of paper and I'd draw on them and I'd put, a world championship fight with Johnny Stracy, not John H. Stracy, Johnny Stracy. And then it was always welterweight, funny enough, because I'm thinking I'm going to grow up bigger. And I used to have that fixation in my mind that, you know, I'm going to be world champion. But I think you have to have something like that to, you know, to want to aspire to be a champion because you need something to push you. And, you know, I, I did. That, that really was my concern. I wanted to be a champion of the world. Um, but you've got to go to British and then European, you know. So it's a long, it's a long road. So it's a long road, yeah. But, um, you, yeah, you, you've got, look, you know, because you've boxed, you, your fixation in your mind is, is paramount. You've got, to, you've got to have tunnel vision in boxing. You know, no one can, no one can come in between, especially when you're boxing on that night. You need to forget about everything else that's going on around you. And you've got to get in that ring and apply 100%. Because if you don't apply 100% and you do, you know, 95% or whatever, you're sure to get beat because you're not, you're not fully in it. And mm. that's, that's what's difficult about boxing. Um, most sports, uh, unless, you know, you're fighting, the contact sport, you're not going to get hurt in the head. You might hurt your leg or you might... Uh, your foot playing football, but you're not going to get your head done. And so, you know, you, you really need every aspect around you to uh, aspire. You, you've, you've got to be fully 100% on the ball when you're boxing. So with that then, and you just mentioned the word, what advice would you give to an aspiring young boxer? Sorry, say it again. So what advice would you give to an aspiring young boxer in that? What I would give... Like I say, you've got to, you've got to be 100% focused. You've got to train as hard as you can. Um, and, you've, you know, if you've got a good trainer, listen to what he's saying. Watch all the aspects of it. I, what I used to do was watch fighters, you know, the likes to Sugar Ray Robinsons, um, Joe Lewis, people like that when I was a kid. And you just, you know, you pick little things from them. Um, and, and, and if you are going to be good, you will be able to do it. If you don't have that skill or that knowledge or know-how, it won't never happen, no matter how you try. When you say about watching, watching boxing, watching, yeah. you know, these, these boxers, you're very right, though. It's not just about turning up for your class, doing your hour session and going home. If, you know, the difference between just enjoying that boxing for fitness and going on to compete, whether that be at amateur level or, right. or wherever, is that extra homework, isn't it? And it becomes oh, a lifestyle and it becomes part of your blood. You wake up in the morning and it, it, it's something that you want to learn yeah. about. I came into boxing incredibly late in life. I'm 34 and I've only been boxing just under three years. So I've got a heck of a lot to learn, but I am having the greatest time doing that. Yeah. And each day when I'm learning about 
and especially it's great to learn from people like yourself, John, to go back and start looking at the foundations of British boxing and really, you know, and, and learn the intricacies of it. It helps me understand a lot more as a coach and as a boxer. Yeah. And I think that would be something I would say to, to younger people who are getting into this sport, live it. Absolutely. You it, you've got to live it. You, you have got to live it. There's no two ways about it. I mean, when I was a young lad, I was winning everything early on. So I didn't have a chance. Like, when I, when I won the school, I lost my first schoolboy title. Six down two I was. I lost in the final. And I said, I'm going to win it next year. And at six down ten, I won it. Champion of Great Britain. And then seven down seven, I won the ABAs, juniors. And then I won the NABCs and I won the Style Award, which is the best of the night. Then the next year I won the Junior ABAs again at nine stone. And then the year after I lost in the semi-finals of the ABAs at nine stone seven lightweight. But I said, I'm going to win it next year. And I did. And then I turned professional. I had my first pro fight five days before my 19th birthday. 17th of September, 1969. I was 18. Five days time, 19. But I, because I was, do you know why? Because I was winning everything early, I was yeah. going, stepping up all the time. I wasn't one of them who, who stayed. Um, I didn't want to win five titles, six amateur titles. You know, I didn't want to win five ABAs and be 25, 26 before I turned professional. I wanted to be young, which I was, um, because I'd done that lot. I'd done six, seven years as an amateur. I now want to go turn pro. And so, but you've got to have that. I don't care what anybody says. You have to have a tunnel vision. You have to have so much that you want to win because sometimes you may not have, there's some fighters who probably don't have the greatest skills, but because of their determination, that's the way they overcome it and they win. They may not necessarily have great skills, but they'll win because of they're so focused and they want to win. And the guy who they're boxing could have the greatest focus going, but he hasn't got that adrenaline. He hasn't got that fixation to win. He, he, and that's, that's why you get a lot of people who drive themselves. And they may not be the greatest boxers, but they'll push themselves so much that they'll win every time. And that's you, what you've got to do. Just before that, about when you didn't win, and then you went on the year after to win. And yeah. I think it's really, really important, isn't it? And it's about, you have these goals and you have, you know, where you want to be. And it, my dad always said to me, if you aim here and you get here, you've done a good job. But if you aim here and you get here, the oh, only yeah. person who's responsible for that is you. And I think it doesn't matter if you don't hit your target the first time or the no. second time. It's that keeping going and it's that adapt Absolutely. and go again. And I, I, I always say that if, you know, whatever career you take, if you give it 100%, you'll get 100% out of it. Yeah. If you don't give 100%, you're not going to get anything out of it. And that's, you know, and, and we know boxing is so different because you can play football, you know, you can get a little injury on your foot or whatever. But in boxing, it could be your last fight. And that's how we used to go in. That could be your last fight. And that's why you've got to be so careful, so focused that you don't get hurt and you can go forward and win. And that's the main thing. Um, and, you, and you mentioned there about being injured in the ring or, or, or whatever. As you, again, as you know, um, we are an, an, an adaptive boxer. Um, so for me, I've never boxed standing up, but adaptive boxing has meant that I can be a part of this sport um, and, and use a wheelchair as my vehicle to do that. Um, what would you say to boxers who are out there who've never heard of adaptive boxing, who have boxed and have sadly had an injury, whether that's boxing related or outside of the ring, what would you say to them having known about what we do with the adaptive boxing program, John? Well, first of all, I think you do marvellous what you know you, what you do because I think a few years back, maybe 10 or so years, it would never have happened. They would have just, you know, it would have been, oh, don't be silly, you can't do that. And I think women's boxing has really helped because, you know, years ago, 
And there, there used to be a story with, with women boxing. They'd say, you know, you, you heard about the women boxing. They get on the scale and the girl says, oh, I, I'm not that heavy. You know, <laughs> oh, I, you know, I'm not that heavy, meaning she, you know, she, <laughs> and um, I can't be that way. I'm not that heavy. Uh, but boxing's progressed so much for women now. And sometimes, hey, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, two or three years ago, I had to go to a, a, an army boxing do in Southampton way, right? And it's absolutely true. They had two girl boxers on the bill fighting, and the rest were the army. It was all army, and the rest was the men. And I was the one for the best fight of the evening, and I give it to the girl. She was absolutely brilliant. And she came up afterwards, I gave her a trophy, and she said, thank you very much, Mr. Tracy. I said, listen, you deserve that. I'm not doing it for any other reason. You were brilliant. And that's what's happening now with women boxing. Sometimes you go to shows, you maybe a couple of fights to see women, but they're, they're getting better and better and better. And okay. I've got no, you know, I would never, years ago I did say I don't like seeing women fighting because, you know, we look at the femininity. We don't want to see women get hurt. But I think now women have sort of established themselves in boxing and they're doing really well. And, and there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, you can look at a woman who goes out there boxing and then it's like a golfer, you know, they go out there and, they, and then when they're out in the evening, they look very nice. They're, they're adaptive. They talk to you. They're very, you know, they look lovely. And you think, what a transition. <laughs> and it's a, it's a marvellous thing now that women are boxing. And I think all sports now are great, men and women. Why shouldn't it be? Why should it always just be the men? And it's great to see now that, you know, we've got the likes of Katie Taylor and people that are potentially going to be headlining these huge televised um, shows before the lockdown situation, you know? Yeah. And for me, I, that is amazing to see women boxing names in the biggest writing at the top of that poster, that's massive. That is a huge statement. Sure. For you know, you know, you know, Frank Maloney. Sorry, you know Kelly Maloney. You know, what I mean Kelly. Yeah. Uh, she is is uh, into women boxing really much, really a lot. And there'll be you know, she's going to come very, very good with a lot of women boxers. So wow. look out for her. I will do. Certainly will do. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, we keep, I, I'm deviating because I love talking to you, John, and I, I, I could all the time, and I know that I've, I'm probably gone way over our time. Um, so I'm just looking no, through. Keep, coming, keep talking. <laughs> I'm just looking through some of these questions um, from, like I say, our young people from the uh, WBQ. Yeah programs um, and one here is um, if you could box against any boxer from history who oh. would it be and why <laughs> oh um <laughs> it's a good no question pressure. actually um you can have a probably, top if that makes it easier yeah uh probably funny enough i, I would probably say um the one who actually beat me, Carlos Palomino. I wouldn't mind fighting him again. Um, because, yeah, there was... Yeah, no, it, it was... Uh, and, you know, funny enough, me and Carlos are very good friends, you know? Oh, really? And that's, the ni that's always the nice thing of boxing. And that's why, you know, you can, you can have some fighters who never talk to each other. And they, oh, you know, he beat me or I beat him and he don't talk to me or I don't talk to him. But boxing is a very great sport that you do interact and you do talk. When I see Carlos Palomino, he's one of the nicest guys, you know, we're friends, we, we hug each other. And you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I hadn't seen him for 26 years. I boxed him in 76, lost. And then in 2004, I met him, so no, it was 28 years. And he was being inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota. And I, I was walked into the hotel. He was standing at the um, desk signing in, and I was walking in. 
And I looked, he turned around, looked at me, and he walked straight up to me. I walked straight up to him. We met in the middle and we hugged and we never said a word oh. after 28 years. Now, how unbelievable is that? That's just giving me goosebumps. I know, that is absolutely true. And do you know what? We still inter in interact with each other, talk to each other. I phone him, he phones me. Oh, He's wow. a great, great guy. One of the best guys ever. But when I say I'd like to fight him, what I mean by that was when I had that fight, I wasn't all me, you know, it was, I, I'd had a few problems and things like that, um, which I'm doing in a book. I can't give anything away. I'm doing a book this year, so I can't give anything away. But it was a lot happened that I wasn't completely on the ball. Right. So that's why I say I'd like to have fought him uh, when, when I was more 100% in the mind instead of yeah. being a bit less in the mind. Because yeah. like I say, you've got to be 100% every time. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be a nice uh, thing to fight him. But if I would have f wanted to fight anybody, it would be Robinson. Yeah. Because I mean that man was you know just to say I boxed him, I'd, I'd lose. But just to say I boxed him would be phenomenal. Would be oh, and I wouldn't have cared what I'd won. I'd have just said yeah, I was world champion. But I tell you what, Robinson was the greatest boxer I'd ever fought. Yeah, How yeah, Robinson, <laughs> Robinson every time. Just to share the ring would be uh, oh, right? <laughs> unbelievable. Um, John, what if anything has changed in boxing from your time as a champion compared to the present day? Well, first of all, fifteen rounds, yeah, to twelve rounds. I mean. When we boxed, we always always was fifth. I did seven fifteen rounders. I didn't do the distance, but they were fifteen rounders, and that's what you trained for then. Yeah. So it was oh, a lot more well, harder. The were like sort of eleven and twelve and stuff. You oh. Know, yeah. Well, do you know an amazing thing? If you see um, Rocky Marciano's record, um, he never got beat. He was undefeated, forty nine fights. But if you see his record. He stopped him in the 12th round, the 13th round, the 14th round, the 15th round. So had he have not won in those rounds, he'd have been beat. That's so that was the difference of, of great boxing then to what it is now. They can't help what it is today. It's 12 rounds and we can't help that. There's no <laughs> one's fault people are running. Um, but the one, thing, the one thing I am against is the weigh-ins. I still don't agree with people weighing in two days before where they can lump on, you know, put on a bit of weight um, because some people, are, yeah, there's, there's an instance with Ricky Hatton. Now, Ricky, I love Ricky. He's one of the nicest guys. He's a good friend. But if you take Ricky, for instance, he'd weigh in, say, 10 stone on Thursday night or Friday morning. Yeah. And on the Saturdays, 11 stone, say 11 stone four. Now, the other kid may not be able to put on weight. So it may be a skinny black fighter or, a, or, or it could be a, a you know, a, whoever you want to you say. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, that's what happens. Yeah. And what happens, and then, because he's, he might only be 10 stone, and, and don't get me wrong, great, great fight, great, great fighters, but he may not be able to put on three or four or five pounds. So he's, he's looking at nearly a stone giving away. And I think that's wrong. You know, I think that's wrong because, you know, mo most fighters don't really put on a great deal. No. Um, and, but if someone is, is a big fighter, a big lad, he can, um, you know, put on more and have a bigger So I, I don't agree with that. Yeah. And actually, you know, we can sort of amateur into principal again. I was trained, you know, it's drummed into you um, as an amateur about healthy weight loss and not to dehydrate and all of that. And we protect our boxers of that. Yeah. But when we're seeing examples like that of professionals, they aspire to it, don't they? And if, oh, you know, absolutely. play around with diet and yeah. water and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, from a safety aspect, I think. It's, that's quite an interesting point, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you another great, one, one more great fighter, and we're friends, I absolutely love him, and that's marvellous Marvin Hagler. Okay. He is absolutely 
top man, top, top man. One of the best fighters ever. And we're great friends, but, you know, he's just a wonderful guy as well. And uh, we, we, we've been mates for over 20 years. Me and my wife went to his wedding and um, we, we actually share the same anniversary, 27th of May on marriage, but we were six years before him. So we've been mates for a third. I, I saw him, I went to see him fight Tommy Earns wow. over in, in America. And um, I met him at the weigh-in and then we got friendly and I met him, seen him ever since. But what a fighter he was. What a fighter he was. Wow. You know, I, I mean, I still say Sugar Ray Robinson, but I would say Marvin Hagler next to Sugar Ray Robinson was the greatest middleweight other than, you know, him. So, yeah, yeah great, great fighters. Great. Thank you. A um, couple of others that have come in. Uh, where do we go? Oh, so coming up, so as we come out of boxing now, um, what did you do on the morning that you retired from boxing? I'll tell you a funny, funny story. Um, I was, I was training, I, you know, I, I was actually going to fight again. And then I was in the, me, me house and I was just laying down and it was about five o'clock in the morning when I went running and my dad came in to say, you know, getting up to run and um, he walked in and I just looked at him and I went, dad, I'm going to retire. I'm not going. What? What? So I just, that was it on the morning. I just got up. Well, I stayed in bed for an hour and then I just went in the kitchen, got a cup of tea and that was it. I retired from there. So that was wow. it. Wow. Yeah. It's like yeah. that. 28 I was. 28. Yeah. But, you know, don't forget, I'd had 130 amateur fights and, and then 51 pro fights. And then, but what people don't realise and you'll realise is, is it's not the boxing. It's the training because <laughs> you, you know, when we, when we did 15 round fights, we trained 150, 200 rounds for that one fight. Yeah. So if you times that by, you say I had a, a 51 fights, you could times that by 15, 20. And that's the fights you had in the, you know, training yeah. all the time. So it was very, very, very hard and boxing. As we know, you've got to be very careful, get out at the right time. And I think I did. I think I got out at the right time. And, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in the boxing hall, WBC Boxing Hall of Fame, British Boxing Hall of Fame. So I'm quite happy with that. I actually learned a little bit of trivia last night um, about, I didn't realise that the, when you won the world title in Mexico, that was Don Jose Suleiman's first WBC was, world champion? I was his first champion, yeah. Wow. And you know, I didn't know that for a very long while. And I met him, it must have been 20 years, 15, 20 years after. And I was, some, I, was, I was in London somewhere. I think it was London. And he came up to me. We was talking and he was shaking everybody's hand. When he came to me, he grabbed me. And he went to me, you're my first champion. My first champion. <laughs> and I went, wow. You know, and I didn't realise. And then, he, then I realised he's... Because some his, uh, his son actually told me that um, it was the 5th of December when he got inaugurated as the president. Yeah. And the 6th of December is when I won it. So, in Mexico. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, we, we had his funeral for him. He had his funeral, obviously, in Mexico. But we done one here. Oh. And I, yeah, and his favourite song was My Way. And I sang it in church. My oh. Way. And I was, and I was talking about, I know, I was talking about him, all about, you know, how great he was. And I was his first champion. And then we did this, we did that, because we were good friends. And I was talking to Mauricio Suleiman, who's the now president. And he said something to me, which was amazing. He said to me, do you know, he said, you was my first, uh, you was my dad's first champion. And you are the last person in England to talk about my father. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And it finished, it finished with me singing after me talking about him. Oh. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is amazing, yeah. Yeah. It really is. And, you know, as I say, a lot of, you don't realise when, over the years, it's like you feel like you've been blessed, you know, to do things. Yeah. So, yeah, it was great. Yeah. And yeah. he was a lovely man, Don Jose Suleiman. 
fantastic guy. Really, really lovely man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I'd say I only came into this last year with the, the WBC and had the pleasure and privilege of um, meeting Mauricio uh, and his family. And if, if that is anything to go by, they are just the most wonderful people. Yes. Really, and hilariously funny. <laughs> You know, we 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 awesome. talk we talk a lot, and we you know we get in touch a lot because I'm on WhatsApp with him, yeah. and he is one of you know I'd send him things, he sends me things, we have a laugh and a joke, but one of the nicest guys in boxing you'll ever meet. Now you remember last year when we was in Cancun? Yeah. Well, I got a picture of him with me, and we got our arms around each other. I'll show it to you, and we're standing next to each other. And I've got more or less what I've got on now, like a shorts and trainers and a t-shirt. And he came down the same. And he just like somewhere, he just looked like the ordinariest fella on holiday, if you want, that you'll ever meet. Yeah. And then you suddenly realise the president of the WBC. And I'll tell you what I did as well. We were talking and he took, he, he didn't have his shoes, he, his trainers on. He pushed, put them behind him. So what I did, I picked them up and I hid them. <laughs> as we talked, we've had a picture taken. Then he's turned to look and he's going. <laughs> and then after about five minutes, he's going, someone's took me. And I went, and I get, oh, he went, come here, you. And he Aww. grabbed me around the head and we cuddled. <laughs> oh, what, a, what, a, what a man he is. You, you mentioned Cancun. On the first night, um, there were, we had to be in a certain area for, for drinks and things. Um, and this, again, like I said to you before, this was my first experience of yeah. that. I'd just been whisked up and gone off to Mexico. And so I'm in, I'm in the bar and uh, yeah. kind of just people watching as you do. I don't know who anybody is, what they're supposed to look like or anything. And the next thing I hear is my name being bellowed out. And I look over and it was Mauricio. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, he's... For him to have known my name yeah. was just incredible. It really, really was because yeah, yeah. they're just a small group of people trying to make our way in boxing. In oh, it, it, yeah. We hadn't even launched it at that point, you know. We launched it at the opening ceremony, of, of the, you know, that you were there for. So, for him to, for me, it just was bizarre for him to even know anything about me and what we did. And but when when he stood up and at the opening ceremony and talked about the adaptive boxing program and the knowledge about the ambassadors who were involved in it and their history, it, it, that personal the interest that he showed and that like I could say that his family showed when we were there was yeah. just yeah outstanding. Well he, he does he does that on every level as well Louise. He's he's one of these guys who you know it's not just for the big. He 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 knows everything what's going on and he'll always interact with you, talk to you about things, you know, and sometimes when we get together, of course you know, he was like, I think he was only about four or five when I won the world title. Um, yeah, five or six, maybe. I think he was born. No, I think he was born 69. Yeah, they've been six. Um, and obviously I met him as he, as, as later on when his dad wasn't too well and he used to push him around and look after him. Um, and then obviously got into the boxing more and became the man he is today. And he's so regarded in boxing. He's like the doyen, you know, the main, the main man. And he's got time for everybody. If you watch him, because it must be so difficult because he's getting asked by him, by him, by him. That's what I mean. And he's just, he's just on the ball with everything. And, and what I like about him is when he takes charge of something and when he talks, everybody listens. There's something about him. He's got this way of talking. And his dad was the same. His father was exactly the same. Yeah, made amazing people. And, and, you know, thank God we got the WBC because it's, it's such a great thing. And what causes they do? There's not many people who do it, WBC cares. No, and, and, and actually I wanted to, to talk a little bit um, 
around um, Team Stracy and the um, Ringside, yeah. Char uh, Ringside Charitable Trust. Yeah, because Ringside Rest and Care, yeah. You do some amazing work with with that. So tell us a little bit about that, John, and then we'll talk about Yeah, the well, it, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was done by uh, some people a, a couple of years ago. Um, Dave Paris and uh, forget the other guy's name for a moment, but anyway, they thought for ex-boxers who may get hurt um, and they're going to build some it's kind of a big, big home, say yeah. 20 bedrooms um, and get people around the country sort of getting some money and donating it to Ringside Western Care. Because you'd be surprised, you know, there's a lot of fighters out there who they may not get seriously hurt when they're boxing, but over the years they do, you know, it does form something and then they could have brain damage. Um, there's a lot of things that happen. And so what they're doing is, is helping people, you know, who, who do have these problems. And so what we try and do is raise money for the cause everywhere we go and try and put on a show and people donate, you know, what they can. Um, and up until this COVID-19, yeah. there was lots of shows going and they was getting, doing well. But that's obviously dampened it through the, the problem um, we're having today. But um, we still try and interact, try and keep some money coming in. And if I try and do something I can as a charity, and there's quite a few of us involved. Scott, as you know, um, is, 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 is just a, a, a tremendous... Um, and so Dave, Dave Walker, as you know, we all, we all sort of blend together and try and make something of it. Um, and it's, it's a nice, it's a nice thing because again, it fetches boxing together, boxers together. And with boxers who, who know each other, we're all friendly, we're all lovely and people see that and then they start you know, oh, I can see what cause it is, I can see how good it is. And that's when they start helping with the money side of it. And so we, you know, you have like the WBC, I'm involved with, I'm still involved with the WBC Cares, but I do the other thing as well. Um, you know, our, our one as well, the um, Ringside Rest and Care. So it's, it's the one thing I think boxers do is we do do charity quite a lot because we appreciate it. Um, it's a very singular sport. That's why it doesn't create the money that football would yeah. because they're more of a team sport. With boxing, it's very difficult. It's more individual. So when you, when you put on a show and you try and get, say, some good fighters going, you don't necessarily get that. You might only get one or two. Um, but with football, you'll probably get the team turnout. Yeah, and so yeah. everyone wants to go and see the team. So that's the difficult part of it, you know. But I think the one thing about boxing is we are charitable people. Um, we do try and help every time and uh, give up our time and try and do what we can. And, for instance, like what you're doing is marvellous. I can't remember the guy you sparred with, but he oh, was Chris lovely. Oh, uh, uh, what, <laughs> yeah, what a guy he was as well. Oh, um, so, and, and I think with, I think with Scott, with Dave, with the people they've got around them, and yourself, I think it, you know it's a great charity, and um, if I can help any time, you know I will. So, thank you, John. That's really that's lovely of you to say. And um, I have to say, I was fully enjoying sing along with Stracy at the beginning of the lockdown, and I think everybody needed a little bit of that. Um, because it just lifts the mood, doesn't it? And that's what it's yeah. about. It's about just putting a smile on people's faces. And people just stop thinking and worrying about whatever they've got going on just for a little bit of time in the day. And it's not necessarily about money all the, the time. It's about that awareness and about that, again, that team spirit. And that came out massively through the, the single yeah, I also I also think it, it's, it's nice. I'm not because I do it, but it's nice to see boxers and people like that do it because it shows that you're not just a boxer you know yeah. and that's what people forget it's like i've gone to to sing and then people say what are you singing for you know they haven't heard me yet but they'll say what are you singing for you're a boxer you're not a singer 
So, uh, oh, yeah. hang on. Yeah. You know, why can't I sing? Why, 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 why is it that I'm, I'm a boxer and I, can't I sing then? You know, <laughs> that's the perceivement they get. They perceive that. And when you do, they go, wow, you know, I didn't know you could sing like that. I said, well, you, first of all, you, you said I couldn't sing. You, didn't you know, that's the problem. Not every, you know, I don't say everyone's a great singer. And I'm not trying to say I'm the greatest singer in the world, but it's something I can do. And if I can do it and enjoy it and people enjoy it, I, I love it. And, and I, I am a bit of a showman. I love singing. I like doing, you know, stories about my life and talking to people and what it's done for me. So, yeah, I'll always be that way until he we, takes me. <laughs> we love you singing, John. We, uh, we really, really do. Um, with, the, with the CARES work, um, again, Aside from, like, like you just said, the amazing work that we do here in the UK with the boxing programmes that we've got going. So we have seven different programmes um, that's under Scott's um, WBC Cares UK programme down yeah. in Britain. And that's kind of covering the south of, of England and now starting to move, move up. Um, but that continues away from home as well. So we mentioned yeah. around Cancun um, briefly earlier, um, but, and that was for a convention that this was my first experience again of seeing of what players do yeah. outside of the UK and yes. when we go yes. out and there. Uh, and you were there that day, John. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what we did that day? Oh, wasn't it amazing? Those those young kids to see them. Um it, it actually I I did cry. I did cry, I'll be honest with you. And I think you know that anyway. Um if that wasn't sad I don't know what is sad. Those young kids, you know, seeing them in the positions they're in and their parents looking at them and, you know, very, very young. You know, it's yeah. not as if they're much older. Very, very young. And to see that, it was, it was heartbreaking. And I, uh, my, after I watched the first lot and going around having pictures taken, I went out and I did have a little cry. And I'm not joking, I did. And I think you... I'm sure you must have cried as well because I know uh, I can see your face. But, it, it, but that's the great thing of us, you know. People think we're all hard and we're all, you know, because we're boxing, it just rubs off you. But we have got hearts. And um, to see things like that, it breaks your heart, you know, to know these poor little kids. I mean, they're laying there. They're probably never going to get better. And the parents looking at them and holding them, it, it's heartbreaking. But I think that's a good thing that we go and see because we see that side of life that we, we don't want to see, but we, are, we, we know it's going on. And then we do the things we do on the night time, we have a good laugh and we meet the, the boxers and we have a good time. But I think, you know, when you, when you see that, that's when you see the, 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 um, the gratitude of boxing and like yourself, what you do, what I can do, what Dave Walker does, what Scott Welsh does, what, you know, Mauricio does, what the WBC do, the foundation of the WBC, what they raise every year for charities and that. And I think that's the great thing about boxing. You know, that's what it, that's what we do. We are, we are very generous in that, in that field. So, um, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm so pleased to be involved with the WBC as an ambassador and obviously as a WBC Hall of Famer. And it's, it's fantastic. I absolutely love the WBC. They are more caring than any, it, it, probably in most, most sports they care, but WBC is so caring. They are fantastic. And, and like, like you said earlier, Mauricio is just a different guy. He, he is a wonderful guy. Yeah. So I'm very, very pleased to be with the, uh, and, and, and with the WBC Foundation, you know, the CARES, it's a great, great thing. Yeah, it really and is. I know you love it. Oh, gosh. It's, it's amazing. It's, it, to sit there and say it's changing lives is an understatement. And that's the thing. It really, really is. And I'm, yeah. I'm so passionate about it. And I, and I know you are. And none of it would be, like you just mentioned there, none of it would be possible without Scott Welsh, Dave Walker, Mauricio. Uh, they're the, the linchpins in this and like I said without them 
none of none of this would exist and and, and people like yourself constantly supporting us and and, and rooting for us and, and yeah out, out to all of these events and, and things that you do john so yeah. from us we want to thank you because we're really really grateful oh, it's, it's, it's you're, amazing, an, isn't it? you're an absolute superstar but i'm going to wrap this up because yes you have been an amazing guest you're a wonderful person I'm lovely to talk to you but i want us to finish off with a little bit of show me the way to go home oh darn that was funny wasn't it <laughs> it was a good laugh wasn't it <laughs> are you ready Do you know what i was wondering what because i felt you know i've always been that kind of guy when <laughs> you're on a train or, or a bus or you know i'd always get up and try something and i'm sitting there i'm thinking because a lot of them obviously are not english and don't know our language i'm thinking ah let's just have a laugh you know let's just have a good time so i thought right let's do it and uh, as you know you videoed it but anyway i'll quickly do it show me the way to go home i'm tired and i want to go to bed well, I had a me a drink about an hour ago, and it's gone right to my head. No matter where I roam, on land or sea or foam, you can always hear me singing this song. Show me the way to go home. Oh, yes. Show me the way to go home. One more time. Show me the way to go home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lovely. Thank you so oh, much. Louise, um, it's great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, absolute superstar. I'm going to finish this off with a famous Maurizio camera hug. So now you've got to give That's us a it. hug. Come on in. <laughs> <Take care. laughs> uh, Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Louise. Kathy oh. sends her love as well. Oh, actually, Kathy, is she there? No, she's oh. upstairs. But oh, in fact, before yeah, before love. I send my love to Kathy, please do. do. Behind every great man is an absolutely beautiful woman, inside and out, and that absolutely. is Kathy. Do you know what? You've hit the nail on the head. That is just what she is. Oh, she's, she's a beautiful, gorgeous. lovely, lovely lady. Yeah, she really, really is. So big hugs to her as well. I will do. And Cheers, Louise. Hope, hope God bless you. And you. Take care. Take care. Bye, love. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.